Hi, this is Ali and you are watching the fifth video in series, How Internet is Secured. In this video, we shall go over OAuth concepts and scenarios of usage. We will briefly go over journey that led to development of OAuth 2, followed by OAuth 2 communication flow and its scenarios of operation. We will touch third-party service authorization and machine authorization near the end. As we saw in the previous part of this series, the need for authorization workflows came out of scenarios where a user had to share his credentials with an app, let's say client, so that the app could access resources using these credentials on a resource provider. A hypothetical example of resource provider can be, say, Google, and client app can be a task management app, uh, which would make your life much more manageable if it had access to your Google Calendar. Since only you have access to your calendar, you need to delegate that access to TMA or task management app. That used to happen by providing your username and password to such apps so that they could use these to access your calendar via API. But there really is no limit to what such an app could do once it had your credentials. It could send emails, access your contact list, use your Google Drive, schedule meetings on your behalf, basically anything that you could do. A malicious app could wreak havoc with your credentials. Google was helpless as well. It had no way of telling if an app was doing legitimate work or malicious activity. From its perspective, it was either you or your authorized proxy, since the requests were coming with your username and password. In came OAuth, an open standard for access delegation, and it tried to resolve multiple problems we discussed earlier. In short, OAuth protocol provides a way for resource owners, you or user, to provide a client, application or website, uh, let's say this TMA app, with secure delegated access to your server resources, let's say Google Calendar. Firstly, it fixes the problem of you sharing your username and password with the client app. Your credentials never leave the original or let's say more trusted website and secondly, it provides ways with which access is not unlimited, but granted piece by piece, on demand, and permission to each piece approved by you yourself. Thing to remember is that OAuth is not an authentication protocol. It is only an authorization protocol. But since it needs to do due diligence before granting authorization anyway, authentication was layered on top of it by protocols like OIDC, etc. The legitimate client apps also benefit as they no longer have the responsibility to secure the communication and storage of sensitive credentials. The user is redirected to authorization website where they log in and then they are sent back to client website or app. But let's not get carried away with the example we have been using. Depending on situation, an enterprise can own both the client app as well as authorization server, for example, Google Calendar and Google Auth server. Or it can be your organization where employees or users log into various in-house apps, let's say appraisal app, salary app, birthday planner, using an in-house authorization server using OAuth. In such case, the individual apps would redirect the users or employees to authorization server for login and not store credentials. Your local IT department would manage the authorization server security and everything. Final thing before we move on is that OAuth does not assume users would always be human. Here's a very abstract, top-level communication flow for OAuth with lots of missing details, but good to read before we move forward. We shall add many of the missing pieces later. Starting off, the user tries to access the client website or app, say the task management app we used example of earlier. The site or app sees that it does not have authorization to use Google Drive to save information. It formulates a request for the identity provider or IDP, uh, let's say Google in this example, encodes it and redirects user to identity provider using a redirect URL. It requests access to Google Drive as part of the request. The identity provider, in this case Google, prompts user for sign in using the username and password. The IDP now processes client request, figures out it requires access to Google Drive, and then shows you, the user or resource owner, a consent form where it mentions that client is requesting permission to use Google Drive. Do you consent to grant it? You press the yes button. 
IDP formulates a response and redirects user back to client using a post login redirect URL it provided in step two. The application decodes the identity provider's response and performs some other steps and logs you in. Client now has access to your Google Drive. You see the task screen and can view save task from and to Google Drive. Note there are additional steps between uh, step five and step six called authorization code grant where instead of giving access token to client, the server first issues an authorization code to client. The client needs to send a request with the code and its ID and secret registered with our server to authenticate client with the server and receive the token. Such steps can be missing and our authentication process of client may be different. For now, just take note that there are missing details and move ahead. As mentioned earlier, you don't always delegate responsibility for login registration to some third party like Google. Depending on requirements, we list some scenarios of login registration on, and authorization commonly used in industries such as local, first party, third party, and nested login and registration and authorization. We'll call this login registration and authorization as LRA for short. So local login registration and authorization or local LRA if your organization operates an HR payroll app, which has both the API and consumer apps for your employees, you might consider a local LRA scenario. Here you own the apps as well as the OAuth server. You would also write your own login registration forms to be used by OAuth server and theme them to match your organization theme. Your APIs and apps do not handle login registration and use the OAuth flows to contact the IDP, which happens to be the in-house authorization server. Since you are in control of which apps are authorized to access what services, you may choose to not show consent forms for authorization request anymore and handle them via OAuth server configuration and policies internally. The employees need not grant permission for payroll app to payroll API as they are not resource owners. Unlike the previous example where you authorized access to your, your Google Drive. The deciding authority is your organization. So employees don't see consent screen, they just log in. The communication flow described earlier remains the same, except the authorization request go to local server instead of say Google in our earlier example. First party LRA or first party login registration and authorization is an extension to local login re registration and authorization where not only you manage user login and registration using in-house servers, but also provide third-party apps services to authenticate using your system, acting as their identity provider and OAuth server. From an earlier example, Google is implementing first-party LRA. The communication flow we saw earlier using the TMA and Google example is an example of third-party LRA. Here, the client may need access to API or resources hosted by a third party, say Google API and your Google Drive, or the client app simply wants to delegate login and registration to a third party. You must have seen the login with buttons on many websites listing popular giants like Google, Facebook, Twitter, etc. Depending on the end goal, the client app would build the list of access to resources called scopes it needs from third party and include them in request to log you in. You as user and resource owner need to log in and then sign off on those requests in a consent form presented to you by third party based on scope list from client. The login registration and consent forms are owned and hosted and themed by the third party. Notice the advantage here as the client app was able to log you in and get access to Google Drive via Google API in a single request. If you had chosen say login with Facebook, but client app needed access to Google Drive, then situation would have been different as a separate workflow to get access from Google would be required. Facebook can't grant you access to Google Drive. It would be like me granting access to the Lamborghini out there in the parking lot, which obviously I don't own. But yes, it's a legitimate case where you can choose a login provider of your choice while wanting to grant access to resources somewhere else. In case of nested LRA, much depends on whether your OAuth server supports third-party login and registration. In this nested login case, your client app sends you to OAuth server which has to authorize resources usage. But it presents you with a login page which has login with buttons. 
let's assume that your in-house OAuth server supports such case. In this case, your client, let's say the TMA app, would send you to log in to in-house OAuth server. And that OAuth server would let you sign in using Facebook by additionally sending you to Facebook OAuth server. Upon successful sign in, you land back at the in-house OAuth server, which reconciles out the user's account, authenticates you, and send you back to the client. You can now proceed with the application. Let's take the earlier example of third-party login in a little further and assume that your client app, let's say TMA, tries to sign you in using an OAuth server that has a ton of social login buttons, login using Facebook, Google, Twitter, etc. The ultimate goal of authentication by TMA is to access your Google Drive. But let's say you pick a login system that is not Google. Let's say you pick Facebook or Twitter. You are now logged in and authenticated, but you are still unable to save your task to Google Drive since this is a different service. What you can do is link or connect account to Google. Many service providers support such linking or connecting and it kind of relies on a long-lived access token. What happens is you log into your client application using any identity provider of your choice. Once logged in, you are asked as an authenticated or logged in user to connect to a third party, say Google, via a button. When you click that button, you are taken to OAuth server of being connected party, which displays a form asking you to sign in. This usually but not necessarily happens in a pop-up. You provide your username and password and authorize the client app to access resources on being connected third party. When the OAuth flow finishes, the third party usually issues a long-lived access token, which your client stores in its database. Now, each time you log into a client, for example, the task management app, it would be able to save tasks to your Google Drive using the saved access token against your identity in its system. Note we are giving hypothetical examples with famous names to make a point, and there's a lot of detailed restrictions on who can do what. For real cases, you can Google for Google account linking to see how and what is possible. In previous video, we covered a scenario where a machine could be authenticated by using an enterprise certificate authority. The authorization servers or OAuth servers can be configured to grant such authenticated non-human users access tokens for some resources. The OAuth server doesn't know or care for the difference really. The machine can now call APIs or access resources like Google Drive just like you do. The system authenticates trusted and pre-registered devices only and authorizes them without need for sign up or sign in using credentials or passwords. Examples are microservices calling each other while being authenticated by your organization's certificate authority. You now have a basic understanding of OAuth 2 protocol and how its use has revolutionized the web. As with most topics in this series, we have barely touched the surface and there's tons of detail missing. What we covered is good enough for conceptual understanding though. In the next video, we'll cover topics like different types of authorization grants offered by OAuth. I hope you learned something useful today. If you like the content, please like and consider subscribing to be notified of upcoming content on this channel. Thank you and goodbye.